So we have a fabulous lineup of speakers. My name is Emma Stokes. I serve as the president of World Physiotherapy and I welcome you all here today. We're thrilled with our amazing lineup of speakers, each of whom I will introduce very briefly. But if you want to find out more details about these fabulously talented people, please take a look on our website. Um, today we have a global panel uh, that will draw on their uh, experience of COVID-19, but also their engagement with their communities and feedback some of the information they received from them about how we might reimagine physiotherapy, physiotherapist entry level education, the positive lessons that we have learned from COVID-19, the changes that we are going to hold on to. Could I have the next slide, please? So your cameras and your microphones, if you're an attendee, are automatically turned off. But please ask plenty of questions by using the chat function, which I will be keeping an eye on to make sure that we haven't missed any of them. If you're experiencing any problems, please just email us during the webinar at info at world.physio, and we will attempt to deal with them as we go along. And the next slide, please. So we are going to start with a poll, uh, Rach, is that right? Uh, Rachel Thompson, who you don't see on the screen, but who is joining us is setting up the poll. And the first, we have two questions. The first question we have is, which World Physiotherapy region do you come from? Where are you sitting in the world at the moment? And then at this time, um, how are you delivering uh, your education program? So, Fantastic, everyone filling out that poll, great. Absolutely wonderful, fantastic. This is great, wonderful. Okay, so look at this. Asia Western Pacific, can I just say AWP, you've been winning on all the polls. It's not like it's competition, but AWP have knocked it out of the park on all of these webinars. But look, what's wonderful is that we have a real diversity of participants from all of the world physiotherapy regions. So that's fantastic. And look, you know what, mainly online, my goodness, we're still mainly online in delivering our programs a year into this extraordinary time uh, with some 11%, the lucky 11% mainly on campus and quite a lot of people doing a hybrid of a mix of online and campus. So that's fabulous. That gives us a feel for the diversity of who's here today. And I am going to stop talking now and I'm going to stop sharing that rage, right? Do I stop sharing the poll? Yeah, yeah. And um, we, we are going to start and we are going to start with Patricia uh, Almeida, who is the president of EMFI, the um, European Network of Physiotherapy and Higher Education. And um, Patricia has two uh, academic uh, positions. Uh, one at the Department of Physiotherapy at um, the Al Alcoita, Patricia, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce that, so you can pronounce it properly for me, Health School in Portugal, and she's Head of Education at the Hansa University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. She's also the President of the Neurology Group of Specialist Portuguese Physiotherapy Association. So Patricia, I'm going to hand over to you to bring us the European perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Thank you, first of all, to, for the invitation of being here presenting the results of uh, a small survey done uh, through Europe. Uh, as uh, Emma presented, I'm uh, representing the European Network of Physiotherapy in Higher Education, and I'm part of uh, uh, the Alcoy Town School of Physiotherapy in, um, in Portugal. EMFI uh, is, is part of, uh, of the task force from the World Physio and together we have been through the different phases of the, of the pandemic and how have we been dealing with, uh, with education. At the moment, uh, considering that we are already at the phase of reimagining, we decided to survey how are we really adjusting our educational programs and for that uh, we asked uh, two simple questions uh, to name one positive change that as an educator uh, have uh, uh, changed or considered as positive change after the pandemic but also uh, from the perspective of the organization 
for that together we all uh, sent out the same uh, the same survey in the case of europe uh, the survey was sent to uh, enfi network uh, which is composed by 31 members and uh, uh, 31 countries my apologies and 150 uh, members uh, and the respondents are uh, listed uh, on the side where representing 45% of countries and 23% of the membership in terms of the respondents for the survey. When analyzing the responses from the educator's perspective and from their individual uh, side, we could identify four most mentioned positive changes. Increased and improved digital material in the way that uh, teachers were pushed to provide distance learning uh, for knowledge transfer, new, no, uh, skills and critical thinking, and developing therefore their blended learning skills. This also increased students' autonomy with more responsibility for their learning uh, path. Both educators and the students became more flexible and adaptable in line with the nonlinear world uh, and the higher uncertainty we are living at, um, at this moment. When we look at the organizational uh, perspective, um, it is mentioned the increased amount of digital resources, facilitating blended learning, and also increasing work efficiency in the process, education, and assessments and students' feedback with more alignment and focus on the essentials of learning and the learning outcomes. The visible relation between individual and organizational perspective where blended learning uh, became systemized was, systematized was supported by uh, the infrastructures. And that's the relation we can see uh, from the individual perspective, but also from the organizational uh, perspective. So we can see a very good uh, connection and both uh, considered as positive changes for, for physiotherapy um, education. Based on uh, uh, these results, but also on the conversations with colleagues uh, around Europe and uh, reading publications, we can see how we move from a resolving phase and the merely use of digital tools into a thought implementation of digital education blended in campus and with practice. We are fastly moving from the use of technology to a multi-dimensional digital uh, transformation. For physiotherapy education, COVID forced the digital maturity with the, the processes, the models, and the transformation into selected approaches and cultural organization uh, transformation. That means that programs were deeply thought on how to provide them in a blended learning mode without losing the essentials of, um, of physiotherapy. Well, it seems that we are uh, ready to enter the fifth industrial revolution where the digital era is no longer a challenge and where flexibility and agility to deal with the uncertain and the different possible futures is the, is the focus. Still a challenge for physiotherapy, but apparently um, teachers are diving into it, are starting to feel more comfortable, are starting to lose the barriers of using the digital tools to even uh, uh, teach uh, uh, practical skills, assessing even uh, practical skills, and giving the time to uh, dedicate, to discuss uh, critical thinking, reflections with students, while they take also more responsibility in their uh, learning uh, path. And these are the results and uh, apparently positive from uh, what the pandemic brought uh, to us. So looking now forward for a more sustainable way of um, education. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and I'm looking forward for your uh, questions later on. Thank you so much, Patricia. That's fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, um, and that's uh, Karim um, Alves Gomez. Um, and Karim is the uh, is a professor at the National University of Colombia, and since 2014 has been the director of the Latin American Center for the Development of Physiotherapy and Kinesiology, CLADFEC. And she is going to give us this a perspective from uh, our uh, colleagues and community in South America. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. 
Emma and everybody for your presence here. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure to be here and sharing with you our resource. We are going to talk about uh, the reimagining physiotherapy entry level in Latin America. And when you are, when we are thinking about this, uh, let's ask to think about what aspects of the lessons learned in, in these periods of pandemic we should keep in the future and why to keep them. What issues we should modify or suppress in the process of training future professionals? We ask our uh, educators uh, about these subjects, uh, about the positive change that we have to maintain, and uh, why uh, they have to be uh, maintaining this in these cases. We obtain diary answers in the in the survey that we sent. And this, uh, this service, these answers uh, allow us to make an approach to how the professor of the region envision the future. Educators confirm that virtuality, as well as the use of, of ICTS, has been useful to improve educational processes and communicative interaction between teachers and students. Digital physiotherapy and telerehabilitation are also rescued as a professional actions that should be projected as part of the future education programs in physiotherapy. At the organizational level, the programs need to invest in technology, platforms, ICT, virtuality, uh, simulations, movement analysis labs, among others. And in addition to the technological investment, it is mandatory to improve technological competences in teachers and students. These tools must be worked together with learning processes in dual modality, face-to-face -face and digital, uh, technological and social innovation, as well as the development of critical thinking and professional reasoning. The training of professional in physiotherapy requires in the immediate future to focus on the development of competences and skills related to pedagogical innovation, digital fluency, technology at the service of education, as well as social innovation and lifelong learning. The curriculum has to be adapted to current and future needs, emphasizing the local and global development of citizen values. A flexible curriculum that changes quickly to offer different possibilities for professional development, pedagogical and technological innovation, innovation the inclusion of behavioral and computer science and the development of uh, core skills such as complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, collaborative work, and digital literacy to train people to be flexible enough to adapt to the changing needs of the context. It is also emphasized the importance of educational innovation in the PT curriculum and the development of educational materials and massive online course, changing the way in which educational content is distributed the way of linking students with the useful of those materials and the way in which the evaluation of educational resources carry out. The big challenge in Latin American countries is to ensure that everyone has adequate connectivity. Digital fluency, skills related to science, technology, and math are aspects that must be included in the current curriculum since people must be equipped with these tools for current performance in the workplace educational system needs to ensure and keep up with the required technologies and teachers should have the opportunity to renew their knowledge and skills in order to keep up with current developments. Technological and research developments in artificial intelligence, robotics, simulation, modeling, as well as dual practice face-to-face -face and digital physiotherapy must coexist in the day-to-day -day training of physiotherapists with strategies for human contact communication and understanding of human behavior, autonomy, diversity, disability, and various ways of inhabiting and living the world. Social innovation uh, uh, should be placed uh, in emphasis in the, in the educational process in such a way that education practices and research solutions allow traditional exclude people to participate in social and economic contexts and provide solutions to real and global problems. This could be possible with pedagogical strategies such as experience and context-based learning, problem and project-based learning, as well with a strategic alliance between society, productive sector, and educational sector. 
general characteristics such as uh, the ability to learn lifelong inside and outside of the high educational institute, as well as active learning, critical thinking, and professional reasoning are competencies that must be present in the training of the future professional. It is clear that current condition implies diverse development for the profession, and they must be assumed in the training process with high responsibility by all the actors, that is, high education institute, teachers, and students. These are the results that we obtain of our position about what are the future of physiotherapy entry level uh, in, in Latin American countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karim. Um, we're going to, I'm going to uh, move through our presentations, but I'm spotting the questions as they go along. So don't worry, I will come back to them. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Sufang Zhang, the chair of the Asia Western Pacific region of World Physiotherapy. And she is um, an associate dean at the National Taiwan University College of Medicine and um, has been president of the Taiwan Physiotherapy Association. And uh, she has um, an incredible, as you can see with all the people who are joining us from AWP, um, she leverages her network very, very effectively in AWP. And so we're going to hear uh, about the perspectives um, from Su Fang. Thank you very much, Su Fang. Hello, uh, Emma, panelists and colleagues from around the world. I'm Sufan Jen presenting Reimagining PT and G level education, learning from COVID-19 from the perspective of AWP region. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, our region has established a network in FB Messenger um, for interaction and collaboration. And the information to be shared in my presentation today was contributed by educational and, um, and professional leaders, Yirong, Shifen, Kishong, Kama, Amono, Ariel, Yuting, Tetria, Li, So, Matana, and Jillian from 11 member organizations. Their feedback was sent to me with qualitative statement like this. Uh, and then they were uh, counted for the frequency of uh, keywords and fed into word cloud to highlight the important messages. Question number one, educators uh, most frequently mention online learning as the positive change in education and several keywords like accessibility, adaptability, free classroom, uh, and then copyright. Free courses uh, have shown uh, related to online courses. Let me elaborate more on these changes. Because COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented, many educators have switched to online courses uh, either online or hybrid teaching model for theoretical and practical courses. Free classroom have been adopted to enhance interaction. Faculty and students are adapting and transforming to uh, web tool use. Students studying from home that have saved their living and transportation expense. In some low resource areas, um, they have told me that there is unstable or slow or no internet that has limited accessibility to internet uh, online course. And some educators are concerned about the copyright of their teaching materials being uploaded to uh, the internet. Question number two uh, is about the organization. Online learning again was the most frequently mentioned change by the organizations. And some keywords pop up were funding, information technology, IT, continuing professional development courses, CPD, advocacy, and practice. Apparently, uh, universities and departments have provided funding to support infrastructure and training for uh, online courses. Some school even promoted uh, 
and marketed their online programs to attract domestic and international students. Several professional associations have told me that they are keen to advocate PT role in a COVID-19 pandemic to promote uh, PT could do uh, pro provide prevention and intervention of COVID-19 to campaign to the government, uh, the delivery of digital health in practice, and then to conduct their CPD meetings and conferences in virtual form. How do these changes shape our future education in the aspect of curriculum content? Our students need to learn uh, the knowledge and skills of communicable diseases such as COVID-19 and infection control measures in practice and internship, as well as PT management of patients with COVID-19 from acute to chronic stage. Some educators would continue using online learning for teaching certain subjects. Uh, a recent meta-analysis by uh, Gore, uh, this year, uh, that was a uh, meta-analysis on 10 PT education studies uh, that show online learning was equally effective compared with traditional face-to-face -face teaching. However, more studies need to be done, particularly uh, larger con randomized control trials and assessment of effect on practical skills, behavior, and learning retention. Safety and ethical guidelines for information use are also recommended. The pandemic brings us crisis, but also opportunity for innovation and collaboration. We are very happy to see development of e-health, artificial intelligence and virtual reality in our region for learning and practice that may lead our profession to a different horizon in the future. Thank you very much for your attention and participation. Thank you, Su Fang. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move us on to our next speaker, who and we're, we're delighted to welcome um, Olajide Olawale, who is joining us uh, on the webinars for, for the first time, which is wonderful. We've had a number of the other speakers have either been moderators or who have been speakers. So it's wonderful to welcome you. And um, Olajide is the Professor of Physiotherapy at the University of Lagos in Nigeria and is a Fellow of the Nigerian Society of Physiotherapy and also had two terms as the Chairman of their Education Committee um, of the Society. Um, he's also an external examiner in, in physiotherapy in 12 universities in Nigeria, Ghana and South Africa. So we know that he's also been able to connect with our community in um, countries in Africa to get a feel for what's been happening uh, in terms of physiotherapy education there. So Ola Jida, I'm going to hand over to you. <clears throat> Good afternoon all from all over the world. I'm Ola Jide Olawale from University of Lagos, Nigeria, and I'm going to share my submission with you on the topic that we are discussing today. I have this outline, and I'm looking at the survey question, and I will go from there and look at the lasting impact of the solutions and innovations. The survey question has advertised COVID-19 has resulted in many significant changes. I actually broke this down into two questions. That is, as educators, what changes have you made personally? I also wanted to know the changes that your organization has made. So this survey question was sent out to physiotherapist programs in three countries in Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and South Africa. Responses were received from six training programs. And the responses were collected and I have them presented in simple forms as follows. The first, the main question, how has physiotherapist entry-level education changed in the past year? Responses were analyzed in terms of changes in academic activities in which we found out that 
lectures which were strictly on in-person basis before have now changed mostly to blended form that is virtual and in-person. So they were no longer on strictly in-person basis. Assessments of students in the programs which were before on in-person now change to both in-person and virtual. Also, we look at clinical activities, how what changes are taking place in clinical activities. And we are able to report that patient contact continue to be on what you call modified face-to-face -face approach in the sense that COVID-19 regulations are now taken into consideration in terms of uh, making contact with patients. Research activities. For research activities, there is what you call less human contact. That is most the science emphasized not making direct contact with the subjects. Now, how are these changes implemented? One, we found that lecture delivery, most programs now use what you call virtual uh, learning management system, which is an in-learning platform for both teachers and students. Teachers were able to upload their lecture notes and students had access to them on the platform. Also, in some institutions, there is still delivery of lectures via online platforms like Zoom, Skype, and Google Classroom. In-person lectures continued in some programs only for classes with small number of, patient, of students, that is most likely less than 10. But these classes continued based on uh, using COVID-19 safety procedures, washing of hands, use of hand sanitizers, use of face masks, and so on and so forth. Laboratory sessions also continued in person on in-person basis for small classes, still taking care of uh, COVID-19 safety procedures. Research protocols mainly change uh, change to cross-sectional surveys and systematic reviews so that data collection for, cro uh, for cross-sectional surveys were by Google forms disseminated via emails and WhatsApp uh, platform to eliminate contact with the subjects. Assessment of students continued in person or virtually. Then, Examination of projects, dissertations, and thesis. This one is now strictly via Zoom. No in-person examination is taking place now. Departmental meetings continued on Zoom or in-person. Then information dissemination to staff and students were by WhatsApp, text messages, and emails. What are the implications of these changes for practice? We found that most of us now work from home or outside of academic environment. That is for both staff and students. On-site or face-to-face -face interactions only when necessary, that is for practical sessions. Also, we found that most institutions, most individuals have invested on technological innovation. The institutions have to put in place platforms which are accessible to both students and staff so that their lectures can continue to be online. Also, most institutions have to engage in training of staff and students on the learning management system and other online facilities. There are also changes made in clinical teaching approaches, such as increased use of video sessions. Then we find that in most programs, there's, or rather in some of them, there's break, breaking of lecture classes into smaller units such that one teacher may deliver the same topic two or three more times. Now, the last question was, what are the lasting impact of the solutions and innovations? Number one, there's flexibility of working hours, locations where teachers can work from home or office. Then there's blending of actual classroom learning with online learning, so that we have incorporation of self-learning activities, use of stimulation resources, and all these put together give teachers and students the best possible outcomes. Online teaching became a regular feature for teaching and for courses that do not require hands-on practice. 
Now, infection control is now emphasized as part of education in the classroom, the clinics, and even in normal daily activities. And we also find out that there is continued use of Zoom or similar apps for meetings, seminars, and so on, just as we are doing now for holding this seminar or Zoom platform. What are our take home messages? I am suggesting, or rather advocating, that we need to draw from each other's experience, collaborating with other universities and colleagues outside of academia because we are all in this together. COVID-19 affects everybody directly or indirectly, or in one way or the other. Also, we need to recognize the mental health challenges. These changes are made on teachers and students and provide support accordingly so that we are able to support ourselves. We need people and we need support. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olajide, for your presentation. And now I'm going to invite Barb to uh, bring the presentations to a close with her presentation. And um, while you're getting yourself ready there, Barb, um, I will. Barb is the uh, immediate uh, past president of ACAPT. Um, and a professor of physical therapy and the chair of the Department of Physical Therapy at Texas State University. Um, and we're delighted to uh, have Barb's uh, perspective. And I know that she has been uh, reaching out to the community in the United States to get a feel for what their um, responses have been. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Emma, panelists and, and attendees. Um, ACAP is the American Council of Academic Physical Therapy, and we are a, a fairly new organization of entry-level programs in the United States. Um, we've been organized for about 10 years, and we have an opportunity to represent about 93% of the programs in the country. Um, we have a, a lot more, I think, uh, homogeneity than, than my colleagues who have shared today. Um, so I did not survey all of them. I, I talked to about uh, probably 20% of my colleagues that are spread out all over, over the country. And while we think we have a lot of differences, we have a lot more commonality. What happened in the United States? Well, in mid-March, um, we were all required to pivot from our traditional delivery uh, to a very different delivery mechanism. Um, we, many of us had to have a total shutdown of our campus for a week, 10 days, two weeks, even longer, that required us to transition from something that we knew very well to something that we had um, not expertise in, which is moving to online learning. Others had some limited access to campus activities, and so they had to develop a hybrid system. But we, we know that none of us had business as usual. Now, over the course of 2020, uh, many of us were able to adapt and return back to some on-campus activities. Um, some went back to campus as a pandemic resurged, they went back to online. So we've had a lot of coming and going and changes in education in the United States. Um, now, I think we probably um, reflect very similar to what the poll said, that many of us are still primarily online, Others have increased their presence on campus with face-to-face -face learning in a very different um, style um, by the small groups, the uh, more intensive lab situations, and some of those kinds of elements that people have already talked to. We know that none of us are back to normal. Um, and the question is, will any of us ever go back to normal, or will we be creating our new normal as we move forward? So one of the things that happened in the spring of 2020 is ACAP quickly realized that, that our colleagues needed resources um, that we'd never had before. So we established some webinars from experts on, on, the, on the online delivery systems, both uh, synchronous deliveries and asynchronous deliveries. Um, this complemented what universities were scrambling to do in their own environments. We had webinars on intensive lab sessions. Um, we had webinars from lessons from people who have been in the trenches and already started to, to provide some unique delivery systems. As well, ACAP established several task forces that looked at what, what we needed to return to the classroom and lab 
as far as safety and COVID precautions. And uh, we were able to provide guiding documents for not just physical therapy, but for many of our health professional colleagues. Um, we also looked at what are the guidelines for participation in clinical education experiences. And then we looked at what did our students need. So ACAP quickly marshaled resources to get through the, the crisis, um, and we've learned a lot. So the question is, you know, what is our new normal going to look like? So I um, would like to just pose, you know, what have we learned over the last 12 months? What changes will we keep? And do we even know what the future is going to completely look like? As we see um, the rollout of vaccines and uh, perhaps approaching herd immunity, um, I did hear this morning that, that our um, experts in the United States are suggesting we may be wearing masks and taking precautions for as long as two, two more years. So I did pose to a number of my colleagues two questions, uh, very similar to whatever all the other panelists have. What one personal lesson have you learned from the pandemic that you'll carry forward in the future? And then the second question is one, one lesson has a program learned? from the pandemic that they'll carry forward into the future. Well, it's very interesting, some of the responses to personal um, challenges and, and personal learning, and it's not too atypical from what we've already heard from the panelists, but, but the uh, feeling was that I can make online testing work. Um, that was not completely uh, comfortable for many of us. We did uh, learn how to leverage technology. Recording lectures for synchronous learning is easy. I can be comfortable with technology and learn to use a number of different platforms and tools. I think we all realized there were lots of things out there that we had not um, taken our time and energy to learn, but when we're forced into it, we, we can learn and, and adapt. And the different styles of learning of students have helped me to develop different teaching styles. Again, we've heard that um, throughout the presentations. Networks are critical and useful, relying on our colleagues. Um, meetings and office hours can be held electronically and work effectively. And this is the one I haven't, um, I haven't heard too many talk about, but one of my colleagues and I had a long conversation about when he said, I have learned to be more com compassionate, to be more humble, to be more charitable. Um, very, very strong lessons learned through that process. As we look at the program, what are some of the things that the programs have learned that they're going to carry forward into the future? Well, I think as, um, as Sue Fang mentioned, um, e-health, e-practice e in telehealth um, is going to be more included in our curriculum than in before. And we've even introduced the coaching skills that can be used through the telehealth process. We're learning that we can leverage faculty resources online by sharing um, with other faculty. That concept of not having to be in the same room has, uh, with everybody else has really given us a freedom to share our expertise broadly. Another thing that we um, has been referred to is that increased um, use of technology, developing that library of recorded lectures and demonstrations that will be available moving forward. I also heard other panelists talk about the engagement of community and alumni um, to support the program, but also to leverage professional development opportunities. We also learned that celebrations and presentations can be more accessible and still be fun. Parents of our students can be involved when they've never had that opportunity before. We've learned to adapt remediation strategies again, to meet all students' needs. We will be keeping online examinations. And we've learned that students can participate in service learning activities even when they're online. All of these things are things that will carry us forward into the future. Do we know what that future looks like? Not completely, but we know that we've adapted to the challenge. We'll keep many elements of the change. We've learned that we can be flexible, resilient, and still accomplish our goals. We have yet to know whether the outcome measures will provide us with more guidance to uh, confirm that what we're doing is working or that do we need to look at continued change in the future. 
So on behalf of uh, ACAPT and my fellow educators in, uh, in the United States, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Barb. That's fantastic. Um, everyone, thank you so much for your presentations and what's, we're getting some great questions in. So I have just moved them into a document here in front of me so I can start to put them together. So um, many of us are talking about solutions and reimagining, obviously, how physiotherapy entry level education is going to look different. And um, one of our colleagues, um, has asked the question, um, what place does educational, educational inequity play in the prospect or the, that you propose for post-COVID education? In other words, have we any concerns about um, becoming even less equitable? Do we have concerns about access um, and any changes that that might have for students entering physiotherapy education as a result of some of the very interesting changes in our educational practice. So um, I'd like to open that up to the panel. So it's about, I guess, you know, this, these inequities that we consider may arise as a result of COVID. So any thoughts on the panel? Emma, I would, I would phrase that we're looking at uh, maybe resolving some of the inequities because with online learning we're able to provide education to students that perhaps may not have had access otherwise um, and if we can continue to provide them with at-home opportunities uh, where they don't have to relocate for a, a majority of their education. Now one of the things that we quickly realized that we still have a lot of underserved areas um, in rural, part, rural parts of the country. So the university quickly realized that we could support some of that digital access. Uh, and, and so that's what been one of the things that we have learned and, and will continue to be a challenge, I think, in uh, some of the digitally underserved communities. But, but we're working very hard to recognize that. And I think that that's been, you know, a learning that everybody has had in the United States from uh, primary to secondary to post-secondary learning is that we need to increase digital access. Great, thank you, Barb. Any other perspectives from our speakers? Um, and I think probably picking, on, picking up on Barb's point about sort of digitally underserved areas or, or, or um, students. So Karim, I see you wanting to come in, please. Yes, yes. yes I, I, I agree with the with the, our colleague that asked about the inequity because in our countries, for example, is very difficult accessibility for the majority of our students, for example. And that is a big inequity to the access of education. That is a, a big concern that we have to, uh, to try and to, to try to, re to give uh, solutions in a, in a very short time because if not, there are a lot of uh, regions of our countries uh, that haven't access to the education, but at the same time, it's a, it's a possibility for the people who is uh, with a low resources that could be at home in a, in a part of the in a part of the training because the, there is not only online training, but uh, there is a possibility if we are we will work together to obtain a good resource in that in that kind of subjects. Great, thank you, Karim. Ola Jire, I see you have your hand up. Would you like to come in? Yes, I, I want to come in, but um, I just want to talk on the challenges being faced by students of different socioeconomic levels, as, as we are witnessing in some African countries. Now with online learning, it needs a lot of personal investment in terms of getting access to data that we'll be able to use to engage in it. Now we have challenges of students who are indigent students who are not able to afford a lot of uh, personal investment to be able to get enough personal resources to ensure that they are able to take part in all. Opting all exams 
online because we may find some students who may not be able to have access in terms of uh, getting enough data to be able to take part in them. This is still a big challenge to us, especially in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to another question now. Um, and before we do, I would like to uh, put a poll out, um, which is asking those of you who are online, what proportion of your programs are you teaching online at the moment? So what proportion of your program is online at the moment? So let's have a little look at the figures here. Can the panel all see those? So we've got a nice mix. We've got less than 20%. We've got um, um, we've got okay, we're looking at okay, so I'm I'm gonna okay, so about a, th a third, so slightly over a third are between 80 to 100 percent, 36 percent or 80 to 100 percent. Uh, then we've got 61 to 80 percent. So over half our sample. 69% of our sample have their 60, sort of 61 to 100% of the program online. So this comes back to, and the reason I asked that poll and thanks everyone for that was, um, there are a number of questions around um, sort of trying to understand, um, you know, as we emerge from this, we've all said that, you know, part of having online is a good thing because it allows for access in different ways. But where do we see where do we see us landing when it comes to what proportion of online do we think we're going to keep versus um, you know going back fully to face to face? So if if being online and digital engagement is possible and positive, where's the balance? Do do the panelists think uh, for programs? So Patricia, okay. can I get you to jump in there? Yes, uh, sure. Yeah, and there's also a question about being fully online and from my perspective and uh, considering physiotherapy education, uh, only in extreme uh, uh, conditions we would be fully online, uh, considering a healthcare uh, provider, uh, but the balance can be reached with, uh, I don't know the percentage, but a, a higher amount of online where, where knowledge transfer, for example, can be fully online. And everything that requires more human contact, more human understanding would require more practice. So that could be one of the balance and also stimulating into the e-health and learning and uh, um, teaching students and, and even professionals on how to have interventions online, which also require a human uh, contact. Uh, so not fully, not fully online, not taking uh, the artificial intelligence to take over, but Bringing the humanity, humanity part into it, we can make a lot of use of these online uh, uh, tools combined with uh, within campus and uh, practice based uh, the learning as well. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I know there's quite a few questions, and I do want to try and come through some of them. So I'm going to move on. And um, Karim, you wanted to come in briefly on that one. So short answer. Uh, no, no, yeah, I agree with the comment of Patricia. I, I think that it's not purely online. And the most online the subjects are the theoretical content, but the practical have to be in alternate way or in direct way. Yeah, no more. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Next question um, is from, um, sorry, let me just go into my Word document here. Um, it's about mental health, and we did have a seminar on mental health, but just very briefly, um, just, you know, it's, people are observing that it's been a big challenge um, during uh, COVID-19, and um, what, um, so the idea that, you know, we've all been under an awful lot of pressure from a mental health perspective, um, could you give us if you have one example of how you have managed to address the mental health challenges for faculty and students, and that's from uh, Mark Ryan King, who's the uh, new president of ACAP. So I'm going to keep it brief. And um, one thing that has been done that has been positive in terms of supporting mental health for faculty and students. If you have an example, uh, let me know. Uh, panelists, raise your hand or just shout out. Uh, this is Sufang. Yes, Sufang, go first. 
Yeah, I think uh, um, the faculty uh, do uh, perceive a lot of pressure because they need to devote uh, more time and effort in using the uh, uh, online uh, technology. And uh, also, uh, from the student perspective, they feel kind of stressed because uh, they, they cannot go to the library, can, they cannot see the classmates. So what we have encouraged students to do is to kind of build a network to uh, support each other and also would try to um, uh, encourage them to appreciate uh, small things in their daily life so that you know during this crisis uh, they, 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 they do not uh, uh, feel so much pressure and, uh, um, and also the students may perceive uncertainty in their study uh, or in their career so we would try to uh, connect with their uh, their close friends or uh, their family uh, in, in case that, that they have any uh, question about their uh, life career. So uh, this will be the student support and the faculty ones. And we uh, try to uh, encourage them to use the uh, resources support from the university and, and also uh, the resources sharing from the international community because there are some online courses, uh, uh, they are already there. So faculty could uh, have uh, the experience um, that will be more easily uh, to learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Supang. Fantastic, great, great response. And we have another question, which is, um, what changes, and this is uh, from Krista um, Eliza Perez, what changes in the content of our education should be implemented to prepare our students uh, to deal with the changes in, in, the, in the way in the world and in the way they might practice as we recover and emerge from the pandemic? So what content needs to look different uh, for preparing our students for, for living with um, the world as we emerge from COVID-19. So putting you all on the spot now. Uh, One of the things that, that we've already recognized is, and I think we've talked about before, is the, the e-delivery of healthcare, the telehealth elements, and what does that require that's unique to, and, and needs additional effort in our curriculum versus the traditional hands-on delivery. So I think that's one of the things that we, we will all be looking at. How do we enhance that? How do we change that? Um, certainly, that's going to be really critical moving into the future. Great. Thank you, Barb. Well, Ajide, did you have your hand up? Yes, my hand was up for the earlier question of mental okay. health challenges. Okay. Should I well, still make my contribution on it? Yes, or, please do. Absolutely. Okay. Make your contribution on both. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, what we found out was we, because of now strictly online teaching, we found some students who were going through a lot of stress. And how did we address that? We had to set up a counseling unit to advise them on how to make changes in order to be able to cope with the uh, new introduction, the introduction of online teaching, which is uh, new to most of them. So we've been able to counsel them, advise them to be able to ensure that they cope, they are able to cope with the new situation. And concerning uh, changes that need, needed to be implemented as per the last question, we found out that most, the, the area where we face the greatest challenge is on clinical teaching, where our students have to make direct contact with, with patients. Now we deal with a large number of students, so maybe one patient, it became a big challenge. So we are still working around that one, but we know that we, we can implement and we are still working on implementing, making use of video recording of our contact with patients so that students can learn from all this one, instead of taking so many students to one single patient at the same time. So we are introducing these changes and we good to continue doing it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Karim, did you want to come in? Yes, related with the, what, what content or what, what subject we have to introduce in our, in our curriculum, I, I think that 
we have to introduce uh, really uh, the, the digital physiotherapy and all the kinds of we had. And uh, we have to form in our students and our future professional the digital competence. And we have to introduce math because we uh, need it to understand the relation in the technology and how to use the technology and want to improve in artificial intelligence, robotics, simulation, something like that, that we have to understand, not that's just use. We have to understand to produce really solutions. Another kind of content that we have to be, be emphasized is the behavioral science and the communication interactions, the communication skills that we have in all, in all kind of placement, in, in person and in digital way. Great, thank you, Karim. Patricia, I see your hand is up. Yes, maybe adding to that, to that is, uh, is the COVID itself. Uh, so maybe content yeah. to add into our curriculums in terms of the infectious diseases. We were not used to that. So not yeah. really, especially in Europe, not so much. So learning uh, how to prevent, how to control and how to work in such an environment. Uh, as physiotherapists, we can't uh, just say, well, I'm not going to work in these conditions. We are healthcare professionals, so we need to learn how to work in those environments. And also the consequences of COVID is also not 100% known. What are they? But it's clear implications in the cardiorespiratory system, neurological and also musculoskeletal. So for sure, we need to learn also to, how to um, treat this type of uh, patients in, a, in the future or similar. Exactly. Great question. Great, great response. And also, obviously, to bear in mind that people living with long COVID will have a very different rehabilitation trajectory yes. to people who, who don't have to live with that. And I know that World Physiotherapy is working on, on uh, when we're facilitating, trying to amplify some messaging and some content around that yes. to be sure that we're not ending up with people being made worse by a particular exercise prescription approach in long COVID. So please do watch this space. I see Janana has posted um, about online tools that is educators around the world have used. Um, there's a lot of questions coming through, and I think this is the big, big elephant in the room, which is, how do we manage the anxiety that students and practitioners and perhaps even regulators will have about this lack of hands-on skill development, if in fact, you know, this is an issue uh, for, for some programs in our students when they either head out onto practice education placements, go to do their internships, which are obviously maybe at the end of their program, or just indeed if programs are doing it iteratively. So how are we going to reframe our expectations perhaps about what our students will be able to do on practice education because perhaps of a lack of face-to-face -face interaction. So it's a hard question, and it's one that I'd like you to, to briefly answer, uh, because I think it is the big question. How are we going to get over this? Yeah. Do we need to? That's the other question. I think we're all assuming we have to. Maybe they'll be fine. Maybe they'll have a whole set of other skills around resilience and agility to change that actually we're getting worried about it, but actually, Maybe we're just projecting our anxiety onto them. So I'm putting it out there for all of you because this is our last question of the day. So the hard one. Okay, Barb, do you want to dive in? Sure, I think that's where we really don't know what the outcomes are. I think what we've had to do as educators is look at what are the absolute essential skills that students need to have when they go into a clinical setting the communication skills, the problem solving skills, the basic understanding of foundations of physical therapy. Maybe they don't need to have a lot of those fancy nice to know skills. So we don't know the answer yet, but I, Emma, I agree with you. I think some of it may be our anxiety about what our students are gonna look like. I think we have to trust that we as educators have built them a sound foundation. And if they're good problem solvers and good thinkers, um, then they can adapt on the fly, just like we've all been adapting. So that's kind of my perspective on that. Um, I guess the proof will be in the pudding when we get a little further down the road after this. Absolutely. Thanks, Barb. Um, okay, Patricia. 
Well, maybe also the the strong uh, connections we have with uh, with practice can be a, a, a trial period of uh, when the students are entering uh, the work field in analyzing what is the real impact and be more uh, flexible in uh, in the process of learning for the less learned uh, uh, competences due to non-practical or uh, the more human uh, side of, of our intervention. So maybe a period where we are more flexible for juniors, uh, for example, and get, give that trust and confidence to them. Great, thank you. Uh, Karim. Yes, in, in Colombia, we are now uh, may, uh, develop a research that uh, what are the competences and the, and the prospective of the digital physiotherapy uh, in the practice, in the formation in education. I hope, uh, we hope that uh, we obtain the results in association uh, with the participation of the physiotherapy, the academics of Colombia, the Colombian academics and the association, the Colombian Physiotherapy Association. And we are now the, developing that research to obtain, first of all, what kind of competencies are for undergraduate and what kind of competencies are for postgraduate because there are different levels of interaction between digital physiotherapy and something like that. And the other thing is what is the percentage that we could uh, allow in the, in the curriculum, uh, in, the practice, in, in the practice training. That is something that we have to, uh, to understand and to define in a consensus uh, between the, the countries. And I, I think that this is very important that we know and that is the, the, the action that we are taking now. You know, the, really we don't know in this moment what kind of percentage or what kind of competence we have to develop in one way or in another way. But that is real that we have the two, the two ways in person and digital to, to be in the, in the curriculum now. Great, super, thank you, Karim. Olajide, do you have a, a word on this? And then I'll come to Su Fang. Just un don't forget to unmute yourself. Hang on, just wait, just unmute yourself there so we can hear you. Okay, I must admit that we are still learning and taking uh, so many lessons in this. It's still a big challenge to know how to compensate for lack of uh, complete hands on teaching for our students. We, mm -hmm. we are still working on it, and we believe that. Uh, after going through this transition period, we'll be able to come up with something that will make our students to be able to get more in terms of what is available now. Because with large classes, there is still that challenge of not, they are, they, they are not having enough hands-on experience. We are still working on it. And I hope we will come up with something that is acceptable at the end of Great. the day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Su Fang, I will give you the final word. Yeah, I think uh, for the short term, uh, I, we, we need to have the uh, strong belief of our students because uh, they are in this cohort of COVID-19 pandemic and they got the opportunity to be flexible uh, in adapting themselves uh, into the all kinds of learning models. Um, uh, and for the long term, I think uh, we, we uh, need to look at uh, what is the uh, core skills and behaviors that our profession uh, is, uh, you know, most value that are important for our practice. Uh, so uh, at the moment, there are only uh, limited evidence to support the uh, online uh, learning uh, for certain uh, professional skills such as uh, cardiovascular uh, procedure and uh, ultrasound assessment, uh, but not uh, other uh, professional skills or behaviors. So uh, if we uh, want to uh, set up uh, any kind of uh, guidelines, uh, then we need to have more evidence on that. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I'm mindful of the fact that we are coming up to the hour. Um, I'm going to put the link to our Facebook group, <clears throat> which is the Educators Facebook group. Any of the questions that we have not answered today, we will post in the Facebook group. So please do keep in touch. There's all of our information. 
the Network for Physiotherapist Educators, um, our COVID hub, and of course, this conversation will be feeding into uh, a number of, um, well, obviously there's a number of sessions in Congress um, which will be taking place uh, online and we're delighted with the early bird registrations. We've uh, really um, managed to exceed the numbers we expected, which is absolutely fabulous. And um, we have got a specific session on reimagining education and what we've heard today and the questions will feed into that session. So I do hope that you will join us for Congress on the 9th to the 11th of April. 2021, which will be a unique event for World Physiotherapy, our first online Congress. And um, on that note, thank you everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Sufang. Thank you, Olajide. Thank you, Karim, for joining us and for sharing your uh, thoughts thank and you, experiences with us. Thank you, Janana and Rach. Thank uh, our, our World Physiotherapy staff team uh, who have supported this webinar and uh, we're very grateful to you for all the behind the scenes support. Thank you everyone for your contribution. The recording will be uploaded like all of the other recordings for this um, uh, webinar series on our website. Take care everyone and we will see you all I hope in April at Congress 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye. now. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you very much. Stay, stay well. Bye everyone. Stay well.